Hello everyone, I'm Ryan the Raptor Guy, and welcome to the very first episode of Paleomania. This first episode is going to be the first of a four-part miniseries that I'm going to be doing called The True History of Life on Earth. The story of Life on Earth has been an exciting journey with horrifying, monstrous beasts, earth-shaking behemoths, a global flood, and even an ice age. What was the Earth like in its earliest times of existence? That's what this series aims to find out. Every fossil that we find has a story to tell, but that story isn't always very clear. See, whenever we find fossil evidence or evidence in rock layers, it doesn't tell the complete story. We have to use an interpretation or worldview in order to learn as much as we can about it. This is why creationists and evolutionists can come up with two completely different conclusions regarding the same evidence and the same facts. It's all about your starting assumptions or worldview. Evolutionists start with the idea that the Earth is billions and billions of years old and that all life around us came about through the process of evolution over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, all from a single-celled organism. As a creationist, my starting point is God's Word. And in God's Word, we read that in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. According to scripture, that only occurred around 6,000 years ago. Unlike us, God has existed since the very beginning of time, so naturally that makes him the perfect eyewitness for when we want to learn about things that happened in the past. We weren't there, so we can't really testify to what happened so long ago. In order to understand the history of life on Earth from a biblical perspective, you need to first understand how biblical history relates to the geologic record, or geologic column as some people call it. The geologic column is a sequence of rock layers that we find all over the earth that is split into three groupings. The bottom and oldest grouping of rock layers is called the Paleozoic, the middle rock layers are called the Mesozoic rock layers, and the youngest rock layers, which are on the top, are called Cenozoic rock layers. These rock layers are a lot like the pages of a book that's flipped down on its front. The higher up you go, the younger the rock layers are, and unlike a book, however, many of these pages in the geologic column are missing. According to evolutionists, the rock layers in the geologic column corresponds to the history of life evolving over periods of millions and millions and millions of years. However, creationists have another interpretation. We believe that the geologic column is split into two sections, yeah, and the bottom and lowest section, which contains the Paleozoic and Mesozoic rock layers, represent life that existed before the Flood and was destroyed during the Flood, and the second grouping of rock layers, which is which is just the Cenozoic rock layers, represents life that was recolonizing the Earth after the Flood. The period of time before the Flood, also known as the Pre-Flood Era, can be divided into two smaller epochs the Edenian Epoch and the Antediluvian Epoch. We're going to start off with the Edenian Epoch. Genesis 1.1 says it best. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, in six literal 24-hour days, God created the entire universe and everything that we see in it, both today and in the fossil record. It's important to realize that God's original creation was created perfect. There was no death, no disease, no suffering, and no sin. But as we all know, it didn't stay that way for very long. See, the first two humans God created, Adam and Eve, were given one instruction, one command. They were not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, they went ahead and did it anyway, rebelling against God. Adam and Eve's choice to sin against God brought disease, death, and suffering into the world. This is where the antediluvian epoch begins. 
The antediluvian epoch lasted approximately 1,650 years from that time after the fall of man to the flood, about 4,350 years ago. The pre-flood world was very, very different from the world we're used to. Originally, there was only one supercontinent called Rodinia, meaning motherland in Russia. There were also no ice caps and no towering mountains like the Himalayas. Most of this pre-flood world was covered in lush, lowland, swampy areas and shallow oceans and seas. Even the continent, of, or what was the continent of North America at the time, would have looked different to us. Most of what is now the United States was covered by shallow seas, and what wasn't consisted of a peninsula, dubbed Dinosaur Peninsula, that extended from New Mexico and Arizona all the way up into Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, and eventually in Canada. Over the years, creationists have proposed a number of scientific models pertaining to the pre-flood world, some of which have not stood the test of time. Some of those outdated models include the idea that the Earth was surrounded by a vapor canopy, and another one of those outdated models is the idea that there is enriched oxygen in the atmosphere. Neither of those two models have performed well under rigorous scientific testing. Recent research indicates that the pre-flood world, just like today, would have been filled with a diverse set of ecosystems designed especially for the creatures God made to fill them. This brings us back to the geologic column. While evolutionists believe that each rock layer represents a different time period, creationists believe that the Paleozoic and Mesozoic rock layers represent different ecosystems that were buried in rapid succession during the flood after they were swept out to sea and buried. Paleontological evidence indicates that vast, shallow, Cambrian seas covered much of the pre-flood world. These seas would have probably been similar to the Great Barrier Reefs of today. These were shallow water ecosystems, relatively shallow, and they would have been homes for a myriad of strange and wonderful creatures, some of which would have been familiar to us, like sea stars and sea urchins, but there also would have been a lot of unfamiliar creatures too, like trilobites. Trilobites, they look kind of like Hill bugs or roly polies, but they're big. Some of them, anyway. Some they, there's they come in different shot. They come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Some of the smaller ones are only a few millimeters in length, whereas the larger species they can be up to three feet in length. It's really crazy big. <laughs> and there were also a bunch of other animals roaming these Cambrian seas, like nautiloids, which they look kind of like octopus, but they're, they have a shell. And there would have been sea scorpions, also known as Eurypterids. These were not related to terrestrial or land-dwelling scorpions. And they, they, they lived their entire lives in the water, as far as we can tell. Preying on a lot of smaller animals in the Cambrian seas would have been predators like Anomalocaris. Anomalocaris looks kind of like a giant shrimp, except it has two arm-like tentacles on its head with spikes on them so they can grab its prey and pull them toward its mouth. It's a really bizarre looking creature. There were also predatory fish in these seaways. One of them was the 30 foot long Dunkleosteus. It was a placoderm or armored fish and it weighed up to four tons. <laughs> it could have eaten jaws for breakfast. Growing in lagoons and shallow water coastal areas, would have, there would have been these vast carboniferous coal forests. These were forests probably similar to the cedar swamps and the mangrove swamps of today. These were very wet, boggy habitats. An interesting thing about a lot of the trees in these carboniferous coal forests is that a lot of them actually weren't really trees in the usual sense of the word. They were actually lycopods. Those are giant cousins of modern horsetails, while modern horsetail reeds, they only, they're, they're pretty small plants. These lycopods, they could grow over 150 feet tall. Living in these coal forests, there would have been, again, a lot of different varieties of animals, especially lots of giant arthropods, giant insects and arachnids, things like that. One of the most prominent carboniferous 
Fauna would have been Meganura, which was essentially a giant dragonfly. It had a wingspan of over two and a half feet. The title of the largest terrestrial arthropod, arthropod however, belongs to Arthropleura, which is essentially a giant millipede that grew about as long as a car. Thankfully, it ate plants. Amongst the giant insects and other arthropods, there were strange fish living in the waterways amongst the roots of these lycopods. Some of these fish had leg-like fins. One of them is tiktalic, and it actually probably would have used those leg-like fins to help maneuver through its habitat. While some coastal areas of Rodinia would have been home to carboniferous coal forests, most of Rodinia's coasts would have been expansive sandy Permian coastline areas. It isn't entirely clear if many of the creatures that we find in Permian rock layers, those are rock layers in the Paleozoic grouping of in the geologic column, and it's not clear that it's not clear if Permian animals would have lived in a separate habitat or ecosystem from Triassic animals, which is the which is the rock layer just above the Permian. So it's possible that they could have, that many of these Permian and Triassic animals could have lived in the same environment. If you were to venture out onto these Permian sandy coasts of Rodinia, you would have seen a lot of strange giant amphibians like Uriops, basically it looks like a giant salamander, and sailbacked predators like Dimetrodon. The sandy coasts were also home to a variety of mostly small dinosaurs, one of which was Coelophysis, a small and swift theropod. Another type of Permian and Triassic animal you would have seen along the coast was the herbivorous Dicynodonts. If you were to head further inland, away from the coast, you would have seen two Mesozoic ecosystems. These are the habitats that seem specifically designed for dinosaurs and a host of other animals. Those two Mesozoic ecosystems are the Jurassic and the Cretaceous ecosystems. Each one seems to have a unique set of plants, amphibians, crocodilians, lizards, pterosaurs, and dinosaurs. While the Jurassic and Cretaceous ecosystems were probably, they, they probably had their similarities, they were definitely different. Based on fossils that we find in places like the Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, we can tell that some regions of the Jurassic ecosystem, which would have, which would have also been on the, on the Dinosaur Peninsula, as well as other places, it seems that the Jurassic ecosystem was most, a lot of the Jurassic ecosystem consisted of open floodplains that were loaded with lots of low-growing vegetation like ferns, not so many grasses. We don't find a lot of grass in these rock layers. The grass doesn't start appearing until like the Cretaceous, Paleogene rock layers. So we wouldn't see a lot of grass. We'd see a lot of ferns growing along the ground, and that would have been food for a host of animals like small Hypsilophodonts, the plate-backed Stegosaurus, and even some of your sauropods like Apatosaurus and Diplodocus and Brontosaurus. There were other types of sauropods living in the Jurassic, including Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus. Now, scientists have often wondered how so many different species of sauropods could all live in the same place at the same time, because they're both because they're all big animals, so they eat a lot of food. But what's, but what's currently thought is that they would have eaten at different levels. So thing, sauropods that there would be sauropods that would eat the low-growing vegetation, like Apatosaurus and Diplodocus and Brontosaurus. Some would great, some would eat off of the me, the medium height vegetation, like Camarasaurus. Whereas the tallest of the tall sauropods, like Brachiosaurus, would have eaten pine needles and leaves no other animals could reach. Of course, when you have an ecosystem full of herbivores, you also have carnivores, and the Jurassic had a load of them. One of the most common Jurassic carnivores seems to have been a large theropod called Allosaurus. Fossils found in places like the Hell Creek and Lance formations in Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, and a couple other places, which would have corresponded to the northern region of the Dinosaur Peninsula, they, they reveal the Cretaceous ecosystems were probably 
probably full of lush swamps and floodplains and forests, not unlike the modern Everglades or some of those regions in the Gulf states, those really swampy regions. If you were to travel through the Cretaceous ecosystem, you would have seen large herds of ceratopsians like triceratops roaming the land, and you'd also see large herds of hadrosaurs like Edmontosaurus. These animals, of course, were hunted by predators, including the most famous of them all, Tyrannosaurus rex. It wasn't the only predator in its ecosystem, however. Recently, scientists discovered another predator, it's much smaller, but still dangerous nonetheless. Dakota raptor has been discovered in the Hell Creek Formation, adding to the biodiversity of these regions. As if raptors and T-Rex weren't enough, there were also giant pterosaurs roaming the Cretaceous ecosystem, one of them being Quetzalcoatlus, another as darkid pterosaurs, as they're called. Unlike most pterosaurs, they would have hunted on the ground, kind of like storks, grabbing up smaller animals like baby dinosaurs and lizards, things like that. Since we don't find the fossils of humans and large mammals in the same rock layers where we find dinosaurs and other swamp and sea-dwelling creatures, it strongly suggests humans and large mammals would have lived in a different pre flood ecosystem altogether. It's been determined through recent research that they probably lived in the pre-flood uplands. What were these pre-flood uplands like? Well, we don't really find fossils from the pre-flood uplands, uplands, so we can't say for sure. However, there are clues. In Genesis, it's revealed that pre-flood humans had agriculture and they made metal tools. Now, since they had agriculture, they probably they probably raised things similar to sheep and goats. Remember, Abel was the man who kept livestock. And those animals typically eat grass, so, they, so the pre-flood uplands probably would have had a lot of grassy areas. And you don't usually find metals in swampy regions, so it's unlikely that you'd find them in the pre-flood swampy regions either. So the pre-flood uplands must have had metal deposits as well. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 2, we read that some regions of where the people lived, they, they were filled with gold as well. Also, if you'll recall from Genesis chapter 4, Abel's brother Cain grew crops. In order to grow crops, you need nutrient-rich soil. So we can imagine lots of nutrient-rich soil in the pre-flood uplands as well. In Genesis chapter 6, God tells Noah to build a giant ark of gopher wood. Now, we don't exactly know what gopher wood was. We don't know what if it, if it was a type of tree or maybe it's a certain way to process the wood into planks or something. We don't know. However, whatever kind of tree it was, there must have been a lot of it. Because, I mean, we know the size of the ark and it was huge. So you need a lot of wood to make an ark that size. So we can probably imagine large forests with this gopher wood, these gopher trees, or whatever they were. The pre-flood world was an incredibly diverse and varied place with a myriad of amazing creatures and exotic ecosystems. But alas, it wasn't to last for very long. 4,350 years ago, the world experienced the greatest cataclysm it ever experienced. This cataclysmic event destroyed pre-flood ecosystem after ecosystem and buried them in massive layers of sediment, which would turn into rock. I'm talking about the Genesis Flood, and that's what we're going to look at in part two of the true history of life. Thank you for watching this first episode of Paleomania. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe for low for more content just like this, follow me on Instagram, and remember, every fossil has a story to tell. See you next time.